All right, everyone. Now in this video, we're going to learn how to conduct hypothesis tests for paired samples. So paired samples are dependent samples in that they are selected in a way that the values in one sample are matched with the values in the second sample. So for example, I could have you take a statistics test at the beginning of the semester and then take the same test at the end of the semester. We could then see if there's a difference between your results after learning the material in the class. Some other examples might be SAT scores for a group of students before and after they take an SAT prep class. That way we can see if the prep class was helpful to the students. So the important thing here is that the same people are taking the same test. So a business example might be if we wanted to look at employee sales numbers before and after they take a sales training course to see if the course helped them improve their sales numbers. Let's go ahead and check out the different variations for hypothesis testing for paired samples. Like we talked about in the prior video for independent samples, we will be working with two-tailed test, one-tailed lower test, and one-tailed upper test. Here is the two-tailed test. The mu symbol with the little d represents the mean difference in the paired samples. The way the hypotheses are written here is that the population mean of the differences is equal to zero or is not equal to zero. So you might be thinking, how is this different for independent samples where we hypothesize that there was no difference in the population means? Well, for paired samples, we calculate the difference for each observation in the sample, and then we find the average for all of those differences. We are measuring the average of the differences and not just the difference in the overall population mean. That is why we only have one population mean symbol here instead of two like we did with the independent samples. For the one tail lower test, the alternative hypothesis is that the mean difference is less than zero, so in the left tail. Again, I'm focusing on the alternative hypothesis so it's easier to identify that it's a lower one tailed test. Then for the one-tailed upper test, the alternative hypothesis is that the mean difference is greater than zero, so on the right tail. Now in this video, I won't be reviewing all the formulas discussed in the textbook since we'll be relying on the results from the t-test for paired samples in Excel. So let's work through a practice problem now. Here's problem 10.43 in the textbook. An advancement that helped diminish carpal tunnel syndrome is ergonomic keyboards, which may also increase typing speed. 10 administrative assistants were chosen to type on both standard and ergonomic keyboards. The words per minute typing speed results are given in the table here. So note, this table of data is from our textbook, but when you do your homework, you're going to be given a different set of numbers. So were the two samples obtained independently from each other? No, since the same 10 administrative assistants were used to test both types of keyboards, the sampling was done dependently. That means we have a sample of matched pairs. So the problem then asks us to conduct a hypothesis test to determine if the ergonomic keyboards increase the average words per minute attained while typing. We are going to use both the critical value approach and the p-value approach with a significance level of 0.01. You are going to assume that equal population variances. This example problem is like the hypothesis test I would be interested in if I implemented a pre and post class statistics test. I would be interested in knowing if after taking the class, did your test scores improve? Here, we are also interested in seeing if there was an increase in the average words per minute. So the null hypothesis is the mean difference is less than or equal to zero, and the alternative is the greater than zero. The context clue here is the increase in the average words per minute for the ergonomic keyboards. This tells us we're working with a one-tailed upper test. The alpha is given to us as 0.01. So next, we wanna make sure we identify the degrees of freedom. Since we're working just with one population, in this case, the population of administrative assistants typing on a keyboard, we will use the sample size of 10 administrative assistants minus one, and we get nine for the degrees of freedom. For hypothesis testing for paired samples, we will only be working with T values, and we'll be using Excel again to help us with the calculations. So here are the steps to run the T test for paired two samples for means. The hypothesized mean difference will be assumed to be zero, but you can plug in zero as well. Always remember to check the labels box if you include the header row for your sample data, otherwise you will get an error. Finally, type in your alpha given in the problem and click OK. So here is a screenshot of the t-test for paired 
two samples for means. I have entered in the sample data for both ergonomic and standard Kibo results for each administrative assistant. Then I entered the range for variable one and variable two here. I entered zero for the hypothesized mean difference. I checked the labels box because you can see I have included row one in my variable ranges and that has the text ergonomic and standard in it. Finally, I entered 0.01 since this was the alpha given the problem and I clicked OK. And you'll get this output on a new sheet. It gives you the mean of both populations, the variance, the number of observations or the sample size, which is 10 for both samples. It gives us the Pearson correlation coefficient, which we'll learn about in chapter 14. Here is the hypothesized mean difference because we hypothesize that there's no difference between the populations. The degrees of freedom is nine, which matches what we calculated previously. The T stat of 3.17 is the test statistic that we use to compare against the critical value. So you can see we are working with a very similar output to the t-test for independent samples. It also gives us the p-values and t-critical values for one and two-tailed tests. For this problem, we know we're working with an upper one-tailed test, so the t-critical value of 2.82 and the p-value one tail of 0.0057 here are the key outputs that we're interested in. This is why it's important to know if you're working with a one or two tail test before so you know which values to use. The decision rule states that we will reject the null if the calculated value of the test statistic t is greater than the critical value of 2.82. Otherwise, we do not reject. In part b, we know the calculated value of the test statistic was 3.17. So 3.17 is greater than 2.82 and is in our rejection region. Therefore, we will reject the null hypothesis. Let's also review the decision per the p-value method. Since the p-value is 0 0.0057, and this is less than the alpha of 0.01, we also reject the null hypothesis here as well. You should always come to the same conclusion, so this is a good way of confirming you are using the correct output in Excel when making your decisions. Therefore, based on both hypothesis testing methods, there is sufficient evidence that the ergonomic keyboards increase the average words per minute attained while typing. Well, that wraps up this video on hypothesis tests for paired samples. In the next video, we'll wrap up chapter 10 and talk about hypothesis tests for two population proportions.